Good morning. I am very thankful and glad to be here with you this morning. It's my second time preaching to you, and I feel like I'm in family right now. And I'm, I'm very thankful for you as a congregation. Uh, thank you for your love and your generosity to the IMB and the uh, thousands of missionaries who are serving overseas. Thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of the International Mission Board and the 3,700 missionaries who are serving among the nations. Thank you. I'm also very thankful for your pastor. I was telling someone this morning, I was driving here, I said, you know, Andrew is one of those brothers that when you spend time with him, you want to be more like Jesus just because of the time you spent with him. And I'm thankful the Lord called you here, and I ask the Lord will continue to bless your ministry and guard you, brother. Thank you that you're here. And you know, God loved the church. I was just reading this morning uh, Acts 9, and where Paul is going to Damascus to persecute the church. He's going to persecute Christians in Damascus. And the Lord Jesus uh, appears to him on, on, his road, on his way to Damascus. And Christ said to him, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't, he didn't say, Paul, why are you persecuting the church? Or why are you persecuting Christians? He said, why are you persecuting me? So that much is how he identified himself with us. He loves us that way that he said, when you're persecuting the church, you're persecuting Christ himself. So he, in his mercy, gives pastors and elders and deacons to bless you and to guide you and to feed you. So I'm thankful for the man, the godly man that God has given to this congregation. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, open your Bible in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, we will be reading today from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, don't worry, next time I come, I have already received an uh, ESV that Marcy gave me this morning. Thank you for the ESV. <laughs> we're getting him on the ESV, so we're, we, but that's good. Thank you. <laughs> but before, as you get there, let me ask you a question. As Christian, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, are you blessed? Feeling blessed and talking about it is cool today. As my sister uh, Benita Riesner writes, a quick look at Facebook and Twitter shows how many people today feel hashtag blessed. In our social media world, saying that you are blessed can be a way of boasting while trying to sound humble. College scholarship, hashtag blessed. Unexpected race, hashtag blessed. Wonderful family, hashtag blessed. Nice vacation, hashtag blessed. As Christians, we use the term as well. We ask God to bless our family. We attribute his undeserved gift to us as God's blessing. We talk about ministries being blessed. But what, what does it really mean to be blessed? How should we understand the blessings of God? So that, I think, is something that this text, Genesis 22, will help us to understand. As we read together, let's open your Bible, and you have your notes there, and follow as we read. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on, the, on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Verse 3. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. Verse 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife. And the two of them walk on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, My father. And he replied, Here I am, my son. And Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, 
God himself will provide the land for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walk on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and, reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offer it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Verse 14, and Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven, and he said, by myself I have sworn. This is the Lord's declaration, because you have done these things and have not withheld your son your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sun of the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. Let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we praise you in Christ. We are thankful that because of Christ Jesus, we sinners, safe in Christ, can approach a holy God, knowing that you listen to us because we come in the name of your Son. Father, I ask you that you will guide us this morning, that your Holy Spirit will help me to speak truth, that you will give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to obey, that you will make us more like Jesus even now. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. This is, has been a very controversial passage throughout history. Many Christians and non-Christians have struggled with this passage. For example, Immanuel Kant, the German, German philosopher of the Enlightenment, he called this as morally repugnant. Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher who followed Kant, said that this passage was repugnant and irrational. A quick reading of this passage will shock our conscience and our imaginations. I think this happens because we miss the beauty, the beauty and the richness of this passage. I think we feel and react that way because we are missing what this passage is teaching us about God and us. For the sake of context, there's a striking parallel between this passage and Genesis chapter 12. The two chapters represent the first dialogue and the last dialogue between God and Abraham. In Genesis 12 is where God called him. He said, Call, go from the land of your family, from Ur, to go to the land that I will show you, that I will give you. Here, he's asking him to go to another land, to go to a mountain. In chapter 12, he's calling him to leave his family. Here now, he's going to sacrifice his son. So the first time that God addressed Abraham was chapter 12. Here is the last time that we see in the Bible, God addressing Abraham. And that, keep that in mind as we go, because I will come back to chapter 12 to make some references. So when we look at these 18 verses, verses 1 and 2, we see God's command. Then in verses 3 to 10, we see the description of the event. And then verses 11 to 18, we see the divine intervention and the promise. God intervened, and then we see the promise that God made to Abraham. For those of you who take note, I have one simple message this morning, one message. If you're a Christian, you have been blessed 
in Christ to be a blessing to the nations. If you're a Christian, you have been blessed in Christ to be a blessing to the nations. And I want to unpack that as we walk through these 18 verses. And then I will show you that first, I will just basically unpack to you the Christ of missions and then the blessings of the nations, who Christ is and then the nations. So if you have the Bible, the note, keep it open because I will be making reference to the verses as we go. To understand the blessing of Christ, you need to understand who Christ is. You know, when we talk about the Great Commission, when we talk about evangelism and discipleship and mission, we're talking about the gospel. We're talking about the proclamation of the name of Christ. We're talking about what, who he is and what he has accomplished for us. The only name in which there is salvation. But when we say Jesus Christ, who are we talking about? Are we talking about Jesus of the Mormons, who is not the eternal Son of God? Or are we talking about the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witness, who is not one with God the Father? No, we're talking about the Jesus of the Bible. And that, I think, is what we will see in the next 11, 12 verses. The Son of God, the one who came like us to make us like him. The one that the author of Hebrew describes as superior to the angels. He's above heaven. He's better than anything and everything. Who is a high priest who, unlike the high priest of the Old Testament, has no need to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own and then for the people, because he offered himself once for all. So that's why we don't do sacrifices today. Because Christ's sacrifices is sufficient. It's once for all. We don't have to do anything to earn our salvation. We have to put our faith and our trust in him, the one who is the perfect one. So to strain the Christ of missions in whom we are blessed, let's walk through these verses. Verse 2, look in your Bible and your notes. God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. The emotions here are high. He's taking, take your son, your only one, the one who you love, Isaac. But why God says, your only son? We know that Abraham had another son, Ishmael, or Ishmael. Well, because God is talking about the son of the promise, through whom the blessings will come. In Genesis 15, God made a covenant with Abraham. So just for the sake of a structure, so Genesis 12 is where God called Abraham. Genesis 15 is where God made a covenant with Abraham. Genesis 17 is God, where God ratified, confirmed that covenant through the sign of circumcision. And here, God is talking to Abraham. He's making reference to everything in the past. So, so in verse 2 in chapter 15, he's... God said to Abraham, I will bless you, and through you, the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through your children, through your offspring, through your seed. And Abraham complained to God and said, wait, how that is going to happen? I don't have any children. I don't have a son. I don't have a daughter. Say, I'm childless. I only have that Eliezer uh, who works in my house from Damascus. He will be the one who will keep everything. And God said to Abraham, come outside your tent, look to the sky, and count the star, if you can. And they say, that numerous will be your descendant, your family, that many children you will have. You know, just a parenthesis here, when Abraham was counting the stars, he was counting you. If you're in Christ, you're a child of Abraham. So then he said, and God said, I will bless you, and I will give you a child through your wife, Sarah. And through him, the nations will be blessed. Verse 2, part 2, the Lord tells him to offer that son, Isaac, as a sacrifice in the land of Moriah. Here we find echoes of that original call of Abraham. First, God called him to leave Mesopotamia. But now... He's calling him to a different journey. 
It's gone him to a land of distress and desolation, to the place where his son will be sacrificed. And it is important the reference to Moriah, because Moriah, verse on Second Chronicles 3, 1, is Jerusalem, where the temple was built. So the temple will be built where Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son. So there's important, a lot of teaching going on here. And he said, go there and sacrifice your son to me. As a, a biblical scholar put it, he said, the place in which Abraham was blessed by the Most High, that was in Genesis 12, 14, now becomes a place of curse. The boy's death will be the death of his father. We see here that Abraham told his servant, verse 3 and 5, that he will go up to the mountain to worship. He said, I will go with the boy and we will worship and then he says, then the two of us will come back to you. So whoa, whoa, what's going on here? He knows what God is asking him to do. But then he says to the, his servants, the boy and I, we will go up and worship. And then the two of us will come back to you. Why he says that? Well, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, explains that to us in Hebrews 17, I mean 11, verse 17. He said, because Abraham knew that even if he offered Isaac as a sacrifice, God will raise him from the dead. Amen. He trusted God. He knew that even if he killed his son, God will bring him to life. He was pointing here to the resurrection, where we were dead in our sin, Will be bring, we will be brought to life in Christ Jesus. And that's what you can go back later today and read Hebrews 11, 17, 19. It says that Abraham believed the word of God even when the death of his son was imminent. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son's back, and they walked up together. Here we see the offerer and the offering. Here we see the one who is offering the sacrifice and the sacrifice itself walking together. We see the priest and the lamb walking together. Just picture Isaac walking to the mountain, to Jerusalem, with the wood in his back. It reminds me of Christ walking up with the cross, the wood in his back. Verse 7, then they get to the mountain. Verse 7, and Isaac asked Abraham, Father, where is the lamb? He's, he sees the fire and the wood. He said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, Abraham responded, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then goes to verse 11. We see the angel of the law calling Abraham, say, Abraham, Abraham, do not touch the boy. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. You know what is beautiful about also this verse here? That language is the same language that Paul uses in Romans 8, 32, when he said that God did not withheld that, that he did not withhold his only son for us. So the way that Abraham did not withhold his son from God, God will not withhold his son for us. He's teaching something about God and God, what, something that God will do in the future. He did not, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. Verse 13, then Abraham looked up and saw a ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And that place is called, verse 14, on the, on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. Blessings and curse are just to pass in bold relief. 
This is kind of the climatic moment of the story. There at the mountain, God becomes the provider again. God provides a sacrifice, a substitute. He has shown Abraham that the land now he provided a substitute. He blessed him from Jerusalem once when he gave Abraham the land. Now he blessed Abraham from Jerusalem again when he gave a substitute. It is important for us to understand that this narrative is more than Abraham being found faithful. It is also God being found faithful to his promises. Because God said it is to that, through that son that the nations will be blessed. So the promises of God were hanging here in the balance. Because God said it is through Isaac that the nations will be blessed. So God is also being found faithful when he preserved Isaac. Yet we see all that, and then we're still missing something. So we saw a lot, but yet we miss something. What is that? Look to verse 7. My father, where is the lamb? That's the son asking Isaac, asking Abraham. Verse 8. Abraham responded. What did he say? God will provide the lamb, right? Then we see in verse 13 what it says. It says, a ram. God provides a ram. Why? So verse 7, where is the lamb? Verse 8, where is the lamb? Verse 13, a ram. Is that a typo? No. There's something going on here because the lamb has not been sacrificed yet the lamb will be sacrificed in the future the true lamb of God in fact to understand this when we go back in Genesis 15 you have that in your notes in Genesis 15 when God made the covenant with Abraham in verse 10 in Genesis 15 God said to Abraham Take this animal, this animal, and this animal, and bring them to me, and cut them in two pieces. In the ancient Near East, the ancient Near Eastern culture, when two parties would make a covenant, they would take a specific number of animals, and they would cut those animals in two, one half and one half. And then they would put one half in front of the other. So they would take a bull, for example, or a ram, and they would cut that in two pieces. And they would put one piece here and one piece here. And the blood would run through the two pieces. And then the people will walk through the animals, through the blood. Basically, they were saying when they did that, if I break the covenant, it will happen to me what happened to the animal. If you break the covenant, it will happen to you what happened to the animal. But then in verse 17, if you can go back in your Bible, we see Genesis 15, verse 17. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. In the Old Testament, fire, smoke, cloud represented the presence of God. We saw that in the Exodus. The, the cloud and the fire, God walking with uh, the people of Israel. When the temple was built in 1 Kings 8, the big cloud and smoke came into the temple and the glory of God filled the temple. So through the whole New Test Old Testament, smoke, fire, and cloud represented the presence of God. So what the Bible is teaching us here is, basically God said, I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham. And if you, and then the two parties will walk, what happened is Abraham did not pass through the animal. Abraham was sleeping when that happened. We read in verse 16, so only God passed through the animals. Basically, God was saying to Abraham, Abraham, if 
you break the covenant, I will die. If I break the covenant, I will die. God knew that Abraham would break the covenant. Basically, the law was declaring death upon himself for the sake of Abraham. So that is because why the lamb was not sacrificed. And when John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus walk, he saw, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Christ, the lamb of God, we see God himself in the flesh dying for you and for me. That's why the hymn that we sang to, earlier today, how shall it be that my God should die for me? It is God himself in the flesh that is dying for sinners like you and I. And that's the reason John in the gospel says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. His only son, the same language that we see in Genesis when it says, your only son. Sacrifice your only son. So the only son of God is the one who received the penalty of our sins. Isaac did not die. Jesus did actually die. If you are not a Christian, like Isaac, you do not have to die. I will ask you to repent of your sin and to put your faith in Christ. The Bible teaches that God created us good, that God is just, holy, love, that he will not leave the guilty unpunished. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, that we deserve, you know, in today's today society we talk about that we need justice, and that is true. But what we need first is mercy. Because if we receive just justice, we will be condemned because we have sinned against God. But God in his mercy, in his goodness, in his kindness, he came in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and he lived the, the perfect life in obedience that you and I should have lived, but we did not. And he went to the cross, and he received the penalty of our sins. And the third day, he was, he, he was raised from the death, declaring victory over death. Through his death, he killed death, so that in him will be saved. Basically, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, became like you so that to make you like him. He who could not die in his divine nature became a human being like us, fully human, to, be, to live that perfect life and to die as one of us so that we in him will be reconciled with his Father. And that is what we see. That is the Christ of mission. Emmanuel, God with us, the eternal Son of God, at the cross, the curse of sin and the grace of God are met. God provided himself to make us one with himself. It is Jesus, that Jesus that we proclaim to the nations. It is that Jesus that we proclaim to those who do not know him. It is the Jesus that Thomas, the disciple, when he saw him, said, my Lord and my God, in John 20. It is that, the one who saves it is knowing the true Jesus and meditating in him that God will give you a powerful fuel for spreading the gospel among the nations. It is knowing who Christ is, meditating in him, falling in love with Jesus that will drive you to proclaim him. It is knowing him, growing in him, that you will want your non-Christian friends to know him. You will want the nations who are dying in their sins to know him, to be glad in him, to be saved in him. You need to know that Jesus if you don't know that Jesus. If you're visiting here and you don't know that Jesus, or if you're being attending church for years and you don't know Jesus, you don't have a personal relationship with him, 
I will ask you, I will beg you to repent of your sins and to put your faith in him. Come to Jesus. He will not reject you. He will receive you, and he will love you, and he will be sweet and dear to you. The Great Commission that your pastor has been teaching you about, the Great Commission that he emphasizes week after week, is the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham. In Abraham we saw, and the nations will be blessed. The blessings of the nations is knowing Christ, trusting him. But sometimes we miss that, and missions becomes a type of religious proselytism, a kind of reward-based religion. Pray a prayer, and then you get to heaven. And then when we talk with people about holiness, they don't get it because they just heard do this, and then you get heaven. But you know what you get when you come to Jesus? You get Jesus. When you come to Jesus, you get Jesus. And there's nothing better than that. You know, when Paul says, he, said, he doesn't, when Paul is writing to the churches, especially to the Philippians, he doesn't say, like, I want to die to go to heaven. No, no, no. He said, I want to die to be with Jesus. Why? Because heaven is heaven because of Jesus. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. So when we come to Jesus, we receive Jesus. And it's that Jesus in his majesty, in his power, in his holiness, in his beauty, in his meekness, in his infinite glory, that gives himself to you. And in him, you are satisfied. You receive joy. And he gives himself to you in the most intimate communion, in the most intimate fellowship. And that is the Jesus that Abraham was looking forward to. That is the Christ that we proclaim. I was talking recently for a friend of mine who was uh, meeting with a Roman Catholic friend. And all the time they were meeting, they were discussing about, basically kind of an apologetic discussion about Mary. You know, he said like, well, you know, Mary, she is no, she was, she was conceived the way we conceive. And my, from, my the Roman Catholic friend was like, no, no, no. And I said, well, and then he said like, Mary, she was, she conceived as a virgin, but then she had children. She was no longer a virgin. I said, you know, they talk about Jesus' brothers and here. no, 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 that's not brothers. Those are cousins. The point was going on, on, and on. And my friend was asking me, everything I said, they always have something, but it doesn't make sense. He said, well, stop about talking about Mary and talk about Jesus. Invite them to, for example, to read the, the book of Hebrews. And then talk with Jesus. Because when they see Jesus, all the idols will be removed. Because in Jesus, that they will see that he's, self, that he's all sufficient. That he is the Lord of lords. You know, the human heart... We always need something to embrace. The human heart always needs something to embrace. It's like, you know, it's grabbing something. And you don't remove an idol by discrediting the idol. You remove the idol by bringing something more powerful and beautiful than the idol. And that is Jesus. I, uh, three years, no, six years ago, I went to Oaxaca, Mexico and to lead a, a, a mission trip with a group of students from the seminary where I was teaching. And one of them came to me, and he said, Edgar, I shared the gospel with six people here in Oaxaca, and the six of them accepted Jesus as Lord. I said, praise God, that's amazing. Let's go try to see how, how they're thinking. So I went with my friend from North Carolina, talked with these six friends in, in Oaxaca, Mexico, and they said, so you accepted Jesus? And then I started asking them questions. Well, in their minds, when they said they accepted Jesus, there's one God among many gods that they have. I said, well, that is not what we mean by Jesus is Lord. It's not like you take Jesus among the pantheon of gods that you have. When we say that Jesus is Lord, it's that he is the only Lord, that he's the Lord of Lords, that you have to reject all the idols and put your faith in him and in him alone. That is what we mean to accept Jesus, to trust in Jesus, the only one, the Alpha and the Omega, the King of Kings. That is the one that we proclaim. And it's knowing him, 
loving him, meditating in him, that God will give you a passion to proclaim him. When you know him, you want to make him known. And that is the one, the Lord of Lords. And that is the Christ of missions. Now, more briefly, the blessings of the nations. In my introduction, I ask you, how should we understand the blessings of God? What does it really mean to be blessed? For believers, is the blessed life synonymous of a successful life? It is the Christian version of the good life, a loving marriage, obedient children, a vibrant ministry, a healthy body, a successful career, trusted friends, financial abundance. I will propose to you that is not what the Bible speaks about blessing. For example, if you take the ESV, has 112 uh, basically translation of words where the word blessed, blessings, is found in the New Testament, 112. And none of them talk about circumstances. It talk about receiving God's favor and being satisfied in him. Just read the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor of spirit. All the Bible is about we knowing that we have been safe in God, in Christ, and have satisf- and been satisfied in that knowledge, in that fact that we are one with God. And that's the reason Moses, in the Deuteronomy 33, 29, said to Israel, blessed. He called them blessed. He said, blessed are you, O Israel. Why? Because the Lord saved you. The biggest problem that, we, that humanity has is sin. And the biggest blessings that we can receive is being reconciled to the Lord that created us. So when we share the gospel, we're sharing the blessings that we have received in Christ. So if you want the nations to be blessed, you go and you proclaim the gospel to them. If you want your non-Christian friends and cousins to be saved, you share the gospel with them. Verse 17 here, look what it says. Because Abraham trusted in him, because he did not withhold his son, the Lord promised to bless him and make his offspring as numerous as the stars. And in that offspring, in that seed, the nations of the earth will be blessed. That was the promise that God gave Abraham in Genesis 12. When he called him, he said, I will bless you, and through you, the nations of the earth will be blessed. He said, will be blessed. It's not maybe, not, or will be blessed if you do this. No, no. In you, they will be blessed. Paul explains this in Galatians 3.16 when he said, Now the promises were not made to Abraham and his offspring. No, the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say to offsprings in the plural, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. You can go back later and read Galatians 3.16. The promises to Abraham was through his seed, to his offspring, and that one is Jesus Christ. So the blessings that were promised to Abraham are received in Christ Jesus. You have been blessed in Christ to be a blessing to the nations. Uh, As Andrew mentioned, I grew up in Dominican Republic, so that's my accent. It's not from Savannah, Georgia, or Alabama. and here I feel so comfortable because I hear some accents here. But it's not like when I'm in Richmond, Virginia, I have to clarify to people that I'm not related to Ricky Ricardo or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it is in this Jesus that we are blessed. And we receive that so that we will be blessed, a blessing to others by proclaiming the gospel. You know, as going back and growing up in the Dominican Republic, I always want to be a baseball a uh, major league baseball player. I remember working out when I was 15, went to the gym. It was a backyard of a house. We didn't have, uh, and 
So it was not the gyms like we have here, like Gold's Gym or whatever. It's like the discs that we used were out of cement. We made it ourselves. And I remember the first time I went there, put 20 pounds on it, and I was struggling. I was just, I could not do it. But then this guy, Ludovino, he used 6'3", calm, put 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, like 300 in the bench. It was amazing. And then he would take a green juice, and then he put a, a powder, and he would shake that and drink it. I think that was illegal. And <laughs> it's one of those uh, vitamins that MLB or NFL have uh, prohibited. And he would drink that, and then he would continue to work. And then he would put, measure his arms, bigger than my legs. And uh, this guy was amazing. I said he was being vigilante, fighting criminals, defending children, doing something. And I learned that he was a paralegal. He would basically spend the whole day in a computer doing this. I said, why do you need all those muscles? And then you do nothing, just measure your arm, look yourself in the mirror. I said, well, as Christians, we can be like that. We receive the blessings of God, and then we do nothing with it. God did not bless you in his son that you feel good about yourself. He blessed you that you'll be a blessing to the nations. He blessed you in Jesus so that you rejoice in Christ, and in rejoicing in him, you want to proclaim him to others. And just to give you a couple of examples to, to conclude, it is that Jesus, when we treasure him, when we know him, when we love him, when we, when we are in him, that we go to the nations, for example. And that is the, the love of Christ that compelled a friend of mine, actually from Miami. He served three tours in Afghanistan with the army. He came back, he retired from the army, and he went back to Afghanistan as a missionary now because he wanted to proclaim the gospel to them. It is that gospel that proclaimed a friend of mine who was a school teacher in Tennessee, now who went to Dubai to be a school teacher in an international school to disciple and to share the gospel with his students in Dubai. It is that gospel, that Jesus, that compels uh, or compelled a friend of mine who works for PricewaterhouseCooper. He's an accountant. He was working in Raleigh, North Carolina. It is that Christ that compelled him to go to China, actually, to work in a company as an accountant, to make disciples in, and reach people that have not been reached by missionaries. So he's working as an accountant in office, and he's meeting people, inviting to the house, doing Bible studies, sharing the gospel with them. It is that gospel that can compel them. It is that gospel that compelled a group of Christians in Bangladesh to move, to leave the U.S., to go to Bangladesh to make disciples. And then they shared the gospel with a, a young lady named Beth, and then she became a Christian, and she was baptized. And that lady, Beth, her family, they're Muslims, and now they're persecuting her. And she keeps preaching the gospel to her own family, even knowing that she might be killed because of that. But she wants them to know Jesus the way she knows Jesus. And it's that gospel, that, that Jesus, that compelled a group of missionaries who went to Tanzania in Africa, where nine people were recently baptized. And one of them came out of the water shouting, I am free, I am free. It is that gospel that compels us to go to the nation to proclaim the gospel. Friends, Brothers and sisters, humanity is sinfully lost. People need the gospel. They need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They, knew to, they need to hear that Jesus loves sinners, that he saves sinners. Some of you may say, but there are lost people everywhere. There's, there are people here in Broward, in Hollywood, in Fort Lauderdale, in David, in Weston, Yes, that is true, but there are not safe people everywhere. And lost people need safe people to tell about the gospel. That's true. There are lost people here, but they have you to tell them. But there are places where there are millions, millions of people, and they will be born, they will be raised, and they will die without ever listening hearing the name of Jesus. 
I think that should trouble us. And I think when we know this Jesus, that will compel us to pray for the nations, either to go and proclaim and to support those that God is calling. And I pray that God will call some of you to go to the nations. Let's pray together.